Right, we're here. We're live. Yeah, Welcome to Book Club, uh, episode two. So on my left, looks like my right from here. On my left is Michael Price. Hello. Director of IRC. On my right is Glenn Bedette from K3. Hi, everyone. How are you doing, Glenn? Very good, thank you. Lovely to have you here. So uh, let's kick off. Um, last time we did Book Club, we talked about the Trusted Advisor. We did, yeah. And the format of what we did with the Trusted Advisor was... Mike and I did a, a little bit of an explanation as to why we've chosen it. Do, do you want to say why we've chosen this one this month? Yeah, sure. I mean, the Challenger customer is a sequel um, to the Challenger sale, which I know you've always talked a lot about, Glenn. And I've got to say, I thought there was an awful lot of hype about the Challenger sale and the Challenger customer. And when I was sitting down with candidates and clients, they talk about it as a sales methodology, so it had piqued my interest to get involved with it. Because actually people view it as a, I think, certainly as a relatively new paradigm. So that was why we've chosen it. Because actually, the trusted advisor was as old as the hills, really. And this is much more modern, I think. This is it's, it's, it's hot well, press, well, well, it? well, they mentioned using Twitter in it. You know, the trusted advisor certainly did not mention using Twitter. No, absolutely. So we, we, we've gone from what was a very elderly text, Glenn, to okay. a very modern uh, tome, really. Uh, hot off the presses, supposed to be the bleeding edge latest yeah. technology in being a, a, a great sales. And it's designed for the technology sector, really. When you read some of the reference sites, yes, they smart, talk about Cisco, smart human resources, Skillsoft, correct, yeah. um, Xerox, if you want to refer to that as technology. I wouldn't have. No? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and our lawyer firm is Legata Law. <laughs> uh, they have an office in London. Um, okay, so what we do normally on Book Club is we go through our notes the, yeah. and, and, we'll, and we'll have a little bit of debate and banter around it, really. Okay. So um, one of the first things that I, I notice from the book is the main premise of the book here is that purchase processes have become like school playgrounds they're talking about. And what the, all the book's basically saying is uh, companies bicker, organisations bicker. When you're doing a complex deal, there's a lot of bickering internally within the business. Yeah, they, they talk about the internal bickering between the people yes, in the Yes, absolutely. Not bickering with the salesperson, per yeah, se, yeah. but bickering inside the organisation. My first note, I mean, I was eight, nine, ten pages into the book, was hasn't that always been the case? Yeah, I think it has always been the case. For, for me as a, a sales leader, my issue has always been with my sales teams, identifying who the decision makers are, who's going to influence the sale, yeah. and the types of information that can be relevant to them. I mean, using the challenger sales process, it's finding what those pain points are, mm -hmm. raising them up, and then coming in with the solution, but knowing you're talking to the right audience with the right messages. Yeah. It's all too easy to go in and give all the pain points to the, completely the wrong person and then say, this still doesn't look anything like I thought it was going to. Right. I've actually got to go back to my board now and start again. And what they're saying in the book is they think that's changed. Yes. Do, you, do you think that's changed, man? Uh, I think it's changed somewhat, more because, because of things like the challenger sale. I think sales teams have been trained and more eloquent with dealing different buying patterns and they know to watch out for those kind of pitfalls. Well, the, the customers... So actually, it's an interesting point, Glenn, is that to an extent, the salespeople have driven the sales technology has driven the nature with which customers buy. Correct. In as much as the salesman has evolved and it's changed the nature with which the organisations are buying. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's not one that I'd picked up from the book, actually, but no. I can see why you'd say that, for yeah. sure. So the salesman gets cleverer, the organisation then becomes, in its own way, organically wilier in defence to itself against yeah, the In a sense, it's like an antibiotic. You know, people know about the Challenger sale. So at first, the Challenger sale was relatively new. You know, everyone was reading the book. It was a big hit in the States. Everyone said, guys, you've got to sell this way. Mm. So it was a big push behind the Challenger sale. More and more and more then, you know, as we go to meetings, you'd start to hear people start to feedback after a year or so. Oh, you're, uh, you're trying to do a Challenger sale. <laughs> you? you're, trying to, you're trying to really concern me. So um, it, it was working about being smarter about who are the right people to impart the messages to. Okay. Right. Um, so I'll give you an example. You know, if there's a big IT issue coming up that's going to affect the IT department, obviously your relevance there is to talk to the IT department, but typically they might not be the buyers or the key decision makers. So it's all about getting buying from different departments before you got to kind of the, the person that was going to make the big decision, to have buying from across the group so that everybody felt comfortable with the, with the sale you were leading. So what they're saying is that organisations now are less 
effective at buying than they were. You see that I didn't. I don't know. You, I think you were well, going to say yes to that, Glenn. Well, I didn't agree with that, really. It, do you know? It depends on on the, on the industry, because um, what, do you mean tech or do you mean division of the tech sector? No, yeah, division. Well, well division of of industry actually, because I've worked across healthcare, manufacturing, um, production in, yeah. in, my, in my past, and I'd say that. Uh, if you're looking at a manufacturing business in particular, they're very aware of what they need. In fact, for them, normally buying is almost, uh, you know, it's, it's a necessary evil. They've grown the business and that's been great. And now they need technology to enable some of the things they want to do. More productivity, you know, more profitability, etc. Uh, in a healthcare setting, it's more about we need to automate. We need to bring disparate systems together, for example, to share information. So there's lots of different reasons. So. I think they're, they're getting to the decision where they need to make a, a solution a purchase, but they have to have documented reasons why it's absolutely essential to, to the business or the industry to make that move. Yeah, I mean, in healthcare, business case creation is immense, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, yeah. they, 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 nothing happens without it. And you must have very disparate, for healthcare example, you must have very disparate buyers in health, very different people buying for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, if, if you ever come across a sale where it's, it's, it's kind of, you know it's going to eventually lead to an ITT, for example, you know, there's only so much influencing you can do before that document's presented to you and of course then all of the communication stops you need to follow a very well documented and regimented buying process okay something i thought was really useful uh, i'm going to move through the book a little bit here was um what they talk about is what they call the one of three problem um and just to explain what they mean by that they're saying you can be a company you can have a great product you can have a great offering, you can have great marketing, but in every single deal you come up against, you're always gonna be one of three. And they go on to say, and this was the bit that actually I think, I, I'm not gonna give this book great marks at the end of it. We're gonna do a marks out of five come the, end of, come the end of the session. I'm gonna give it a stinker actually. But something that has really got me thinking about it is what they talk about is this situation where you're one of three suppliers, and they're saying, in pretty much every decent deal you're going for now, you want the three suppliers. And what they're saying is that you might have the best, most feature-rich offering. You might have the best solution to a client's problem, which is, this is, a, I think, a pain for us as inward revenue. And then the client turns around to you and says, wow, you guys do it so different. Wow, you guys are so wonderful. Now, the other two people that pitch, they're doing it at half the price for you. Can you do it at their price? And what they're saying is the, the challenge facing salespeople nowadays is what they call the good enough trap, where actually the client turns around to you and says, listen, they're doing it at 10% or they're doing it at X price. Well, you'll get that in case you They're doing it at price yeah. X. It's good enough. Can you cover that? Because we'd really prefer to buy your product. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you've just shaved half, half your profit. And so I, I thought that was really interesting because that, that hit a raw nerve with me. Yeah. And I'm smiling because you're going to give this. You're going to give this bad marks, and I just think that's nonsense. Because I actually think if you're going to give that book bad marks, what you're saying is that the content of the book is incorrect. And I, I think I, you struggle to. I think you would struggle to disagree with the content of that book because actually, whether you're selling computer software, whether you're selling recruitment services, or whatever it is, at some point price comes in. Yes, of course it does. And, and my issue is that touched my nerve. I still think the book's pants. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that. You must see that. You must, you know. Listen, uh, I, I agree. I, I, I think price price does always come into it. It's always got to be a factor and an issue. But I would say this: if you can demonstrate value, it doesn't matter what sector it is. People will sometimes pay more than they expected to pay for a product. If you can go in and say it will do this, this, and this. But in three or four years time, you're going to be at this stage. Why not invest now and get everything or have the ability to expand? Then I think you can always... You see, because that... Sorry to interrupt you, but the, the book talks about something called a mobilizer. Yeah. So basically, your mobilizer is the person that can make things happen. And I think the mobilizer is the person that's more closely linked to value rather than price, which is what you're saying about. Yeah. 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 So, that, so that's what you're talking about yeah. there. But I, I, and this is my criticism of the book, actually. I couldn't sort of help but think... That let's say I worked for you, Glenn, and I came back with a dealer, and you said to me, who are you dealing with, Mike? And I went, well, I'm dealing with a mobiliser, Glenn. And you went, brilliant. Uh, have they got budget, authority, and need? 
I said, no, you'd say, all right, thanks for turning up, mate. Go and find one that has. And I didn't, I sort of didn't get that with the book. I thought the book was falling down there. Because whilst, you know what I mean? Because whilst the mobile, because it, it says the mobiliser need not necessarily be the person with the budget, the authority, and the need. And I thought it was counterintuitive for lots of sales environments, that. Yeah, well, I, I, wrote, I wrote in a margin reading the book, are we not? Are you not trying to just sell me uh, power base selling by Jim Holden here with the fox? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, come across that. I'm, you know, you know that, it, was that, one that. Of the, it was one of the first books I read on complex selling. Christ, I, I still had a ginger beard, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I couldn't help but feel in a lot of different points. They talk about this mobilizer. Jim Holden was talking about a fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. What? Twenty five years ago. Yeah, yeah, right, absolutely. But uh, you know, my my, my father, uh, he, he he refers to some people as what he calls. A, I'm going to not swear too badly here because we are live on YouTube, and I like our YouTube uh, good status rating. He calls them pile of poo people. Where I think if you put a pile of poo in a room, he said everybody will want one. Um, and I think sometimes this is what I call a pile of poo book. Everybody's going to go out. And I think two years from now, 18 months from now, every candidate we interview will be talking about finding the hidden mobiliser in the account. Me and you'll be sat there face palming, going, oh, right, yes, okay. No, yes, well, that, you, but what you're commenting on is people's inability to find the hidden mobiliser in an account. Because you know this, Glenn, you've got some salespeople over the years who can really engage with the, the mobiliser or the fox or whatever. Yeah. And some people who can't. Yeah. And the problem with these books is, is you've got to be able to engage with those people. Do you know what? I, I think the problem with any of these books, doesn't matter if it's the Challenger customer or any sales book, yeah. at the end of the day, as we all know, people buy from people. Yes, they If do. you're the type of person that can work across the breadth of an organisation, irrespective. irrespective of what it is, or what, you've got a better chance of selling. Yeah. And you've got a better chance of selling what the customer wants and making them delighted after they've bought it. Because so, you've spoken to more people across the business mm. than, than your competitor. You've done it in a different way and with a different style. It's also just as important to be able to say no and walk away from a deal at times as well. So when you uncover all of the pain, if you think you can't address all of that pain, just say, it's quite... Well, it does talk about that in the book, doesn't it, with blockers? Yes. Yeah. It says, turn your blockers into non-blockers. And there's a, there's, a, there's a diagram where it says 25% of non-blockers or something like that. Yeah. And I looked at it and thought, if, tw if a quarter of that organisation didn't want to buy what I had... I'd still yeah. find a way of winning a deal. Well, well you said the books... They, right. they've got well, the as a salesman, you're right, you would. But as an organisation, depending on the size of the organisation, sometimes, breadth of your sales team, the opportunities you've got in front of you, at times, you do have to say, how much of our time and effort do we invest in this business? If this blocker is going to hold us back for a year and we need to sell within the next four months... Correct. So let's, go, let's, go and sell, let's go and sell to somebody who's going to buy something in the next four yeah, months. Yeah, so sometimes you have to take that into account. They're yeah. saying that, and I thought, that, you know, shock, horror, gasp when they said this, the strategy of tracking down individual buying influencers and winning them over, they're saying that's dead. <laughs> yeah, well... I'm not buying it. Me neither. Be because I think... You could spend all of your time, sorry Mike, but you could spend yeah, all fine. of your time thinking this is the one guy or lady that's going to influence everyone in the business to say, I want to buy from Glen Burdett. Yeah. And you spend three months backwards and forwards and you do all of the socialising and you pick up all of the pain points, present them with all of the documents and information. All that that insight. Make, all the insight you, you share with them, all the referenceability, invest a hell of a lot of time and effort. And then you find out that actually that person's moving on or that influencer hasn't really got the relationship with the board that you thought they may have had all along, mm -hmm. and you've virtually wasted the, you know, the, yeah. the six months. But they weren't the mobiliser you thought they were. No. So, so they are key, it is key, mm. but I think what's more key is for the salesperson or the sales team that's working on that deal to make sure that the contact base is expanded and quickly from either a mobiliser or an influencer as soon as possible. Yeah. And it doesn't tell you that in the book. No, it doesn't. Well, I think it's there's a very idealised version, and the thing that yeah, I what's wrong with what's wrong with trying to head for perfection? You know, I'm a decent golfer, and I, when I sell a tee, I think to myself, "All right, I'm not Tiger Woods, but I want to rifle but, but this thing." But why not have Tiger Woods' stance? Yeah, well. It, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll stand like an abs, uh, you know, I'll I'll stand like a, an ostrich or something instead. And see these people well, teeing off on the golf course, and I think, 
yeah, I'll tell you what, why don't you decide to stand badly and then lo and behold, you've hit the ball carved Price, in my issue with it is, is that the book is written from a standpoint of being purely... Every, the book's every, based on research. No, the book's based on research. That's a bit like listening to those makeup adverts that my missus watches on the TV. <laughs> 95% of women said that their skin felt better after using our makeup. Brackets underneath the bottom, uh, a survey of 11 It's girls. not many, is it? I've noted that. It's not many. S survey of 11 said that, that the makeup... Oh, and of all the people that we did research, actually, the research all took place in uh, the complete enterprise market. Oh, I've got a better idea then. How about we don't do any research? All right, yeah, the research is great. My point is, Mike, that the book is predicated upon research in the enterprise market. So every example, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, apart from some pseudo example with some company called Dentsply, every example is some company like Xerox, Skillsoft. Oh, they go on about at the back end of the book. Uh, ADP have changed their back. They've also said that using a sales process is out now. Mm -hmm. What they're now telling us is we've got to have a buying mapping process. We have to map the customers' buying process. Well. ADP, so you're telling me ADP's buying process doesn't work? No. What they're oh, saying really? is what they're saying is that ADP don't have a sales process now. They have a customer buying process. Yeah, well. And what their point, my point is, ADP. Hold on a minute. You, you're one of the three in every deal you go for anyway. You're market leader in payroll automation. Yeah, why are they a market leader in payroll automation? Because they've got a decent sales process? No, they're a market leader in payroll automation. Oh, I know, they're a market I know, leader in I know. I'll tell you what, why, why don't we, why don't we uh, have a fight in a minute? <laughs> Step in. I'm not Sorry fighting price. He goes boxing on. Why well, have you on this section? Well, I think you have to have a buy. I think you have to have a process, a sales process that you're going to go through. Now, when you look at a particular deal that's in front of you or a solution that's required, mm. you don't just map. You should have everything within your A to Z, as it were, in the process. But you should be able to be nimble enough to jump from B to F yeah. and know what you've missed in C, D, and E. And so, not be prescriptive and say, well, I've got to do that, and I've exactly, got to do that, but, and I've got to do but that. But if you map every time, in this case, this is the best process for us to follow with this customer. So we won't, you know what, we won't do that. Or we'll do two of what we normally do at the second stage, because that's right for this client. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to bite my tongue a bit, Glenn, because you're a client, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I sort of think to myself, I, you know, I met a company a while ago, only a small company. Um, and they were a real pain in the ass to engage with. The T's and T's took ages, they were pedantic over them and all this kind of stuff. And after a bit of interaction, the client, who was the owner of the company, he said to me, Mike, what would you rather we did? Why don't we just set off like a set of cowboys? Or actually, should we start having the process of the aspiration of the companies that we're trying to join? And the, the thing about the process and the book and all that stuff... So your client's trying to act like an enterprise client? Yeah, so what's wrong with having a process and acting like an enterprise client? Let's be fair, the book talks about Cisco. I don't know, they seem to have done all right, I think. Yes, so the book's saying that we shouldn't have a sales process. What we should have is a map of the client's buying process and that we should be asking ourselves, where are we in the client's buying process, not where are we in our selling process? Yeah, two things are the same. They're saying it's not. I don't agree. I think you're misquoting them. I don't think that's what they're saying. Am I misquoting it? Well, one of us is. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I've heard, well, I've listened to it as an audio book. I've read it cover to cover, and then I've read it again reading my notes this morning. I've read it three times. I can assure you guys he's got about 100 tabs in, there <laughs> in that book as well marked up. So, uh, yeah. Okay, couple of questions then. So, uh, uh, Mike, what, to what extent do you guys agree that customers are 57% of the way through a deal before they reach out to a supplier? They're only 57% of the way through they reach to a supplier if you contact them 57% of the way through. What, if the supplier hasn't reached out to them? Yeah, and what I mean by that is, so sometimes you'll get it, we all get it. Client phones you and says, listen, I want to buy some of what you've got. Right. But you have one buy say. If they're saying that to you, they're a long way through. But actually, if you interact with the client early enough and get into their buying process early enough, then that's not the case. So I actually didn't like that as a statement. Okay, phone rings tomorrow morning, me and you're in the office. Yeah. Hello, is that Inward Revenue Consulting? Yeah. yeah. Hi. I'm from an IT company you've never heard of. We need three salesmen. Yeah. What are the fundamental issues that we get with that client usually? They're engaged with other people sometimes. Yeah. They are making a knee jerk reaction to having lost someone. Yeah. You know, not many clients go, oh, I think I might recruit in six months. I'll start briefing the recruiter now. So Glenn, they should do though. 
phone rings tomorrow at any different point in your career. Yeah. Uh, email comes in, hi, we have an urgent requirement for a new system. How fundamentally different is that to a deal where actually you've nurtured that over a period of time? Well, in terms of conversion rates, it's huge. Higher obviously. or lower? Uh, well, if someone's coming to us and saying they want a new system, actually, if we haven't nurtured it for a long while, it's, it's normally lower. Yeah. Okay, so you know, recommendations are obviously completely different. Yeah. Some that's used the system well, or software before, then you know that they know it does what it says on the tin and they happily repeat the exercise. Um, but what I, I, I agree with the point, of, I don't know about the 57%, mm. but I agree the market is completely different now in the, the, in the majority of occasions when we speak to clients or they come and approach us, by the time we actually get to pick up the phone and speak to them, they've downloaded a brochure in the majority of occasions, they've gone and looked at the website, they've gone and looked at other customers, they, they've done a lot of research. You know, they may have been, they're better prepared information-wise before they come to you. Far more. So, so what does that mean? It means that we have to up our game in terms of the first interaction because we need to kind of understand that they've been on the website. So there are all sorts of sophisticated ways now where you can see sort of website traffic, who's downloaded your online brochures, for example, who's been picking up and talking to, you know, some, some of your existing customers. So you have to be really good at that sort of knowledge gaining before you even engage in the first face-to-face -face or telephone conversation is absolutely vital. Yeah. So you're understanding that, you know, people have already got information about the business and their potential use for the system. I, I, I think, I wouldn't say they're unicorns, but middle ground here, and I am sitting on the fence, is occasionally, and I, you know, if I was to guess, I'd say it's 10% of the time, you've got someone that's involved in the deal um, who's more than an influencer, they've kind of already made their mind up they want to work with you. And that's either a personality thing, because they like your style and they like the company ethics yes. and the way you work, or it's based on history because they've worked with you before or they're very close to someone that's worked with you and they know what you say, your word is your bond in effect. Well, do you know what? It's interesting you say that. We do get that a lot in recruitment. You get you know, guys that move from one place to another right. and they'll just pop up and say, listen, I'm here now, kind of thing. Yeah. We've got a minute client in London where he's a very senior guy and we've worked with him before, he disappeared, didn't know where he'd gone. Mm. Phone us up, and of course he's there. Now, mm. is he a coach or is he mobile? He's got to be a coach, isn't he? Well, I think the, the other thing the coach does, Jonathan, is they, um, they, they'll work through the business, throwing out positivity. So they'll say, you guys are really going to like, you know. Because that's what they get when they come thing. in, because what, what they've done in other businesses will really assist you. You know that problem you had? And, and they'll scatter gun good ideas and positivity. Now that's great, but, but it does put even more pressure on the team when they're going, because boy, you better deliver. <laughs> yeah. Because this person's well, that you know, not just an influence, the so they can become a detractor for you for the future if, if you don't do so an that's, exceptional that's, job. That they're actually more mobilizers, because they're saying that your coach will teach you how to win the deal, but a mobilizer will go win the deal for you if you teach him, if you help give him the tools and the kit to do it. Yes, I see your distinction now, actually. Yeah. So, the, so right. what, what they're saying is, actually to get somebody who's gonna sit you down and say, right, go see him next, or go see him next, they say that doesn't exist. What they do say exists is somebody who you can sit with and that you can coach and say, look, here's, here's a white paper that we've written for uh, finance directors. Mm. You go take that to your finance director, but it's not even got our logo on it, so you don't look like our stooge. Mm. And you can go and show him uh, how you can... They were talking about Skillsoft doing that, weren't they? Yeah, they talked about a lot of these companies yes. creating sort of yeah. unbranded insight-based material. Something that actually, I, I, again, didn't so much hit a nerve, but actually was something I did get out of the book and that I'll probably be thinking a lot more about and neither knew about for, for months on end now, is creating a client toolkit. Oh, I wrote that down. So what they're talking about with client yeah, toolkits yeah, I here is... Rather, so for example, a challenge we have as a business sometimes is clients, often when you plug into a client and say, tell me about your vacancy, they've never really thought about it. Or often clients have never really thought about who are the top five salespeople in my team and why. Hmm. Very rare. If you said to a client, why is he so good? They'd say, oh, because he just works really hard. But they've never really done that much research into it. And what it got me thinking about was creating a toolkit where we'd go to our clients and say, mm. here is a process that you can use 
to more deeply analyse your recruitment pains. And I, I, could, I could immediately see in any organisation that kind of toolkit working. They give an example of Skillsoft, don't they? Where they do, and they also use Marketo as well, the marketing yeah, automation company. Yeah, where Marketo have got loads of material on how to buy a marketing automation system. It's not got a Marketo logo on it anywhere. Right. So it's a guide on how to buy a marketing automation system. Smart, I thought. But it don't, the, the, you don't find out that Marketo wrote it until about page 65. Right. Which I thought was really neat, actually. Yeah. Very counterintuitive to what is my natural tendency, which is to walk into a meeting and start bugging. Yeah, oh. and, I, and I think that's... <laughs> It is. I think across any industry, whether you're selling software or toothpaste, yeah. you, generally you're right. The worst thing that the reviewer wants to start hearing is how brilliant your company is, how long you've been going, how many people you employ, why you're so brilliant and why they should just choose you. Uh, my view is that you're right. When, you, when you're selling, you should be all about how much you understand that customer's business, why they've got the need, and then how you're going to address those needs. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I completely agree with you. And what's interesting is, you know, I spend my life talking to salespeople or interviewing them or working with them as clients. You know, I literally spend my life with salespeople. Mm. What you just said, Glenn, I think 15% of the salespeople I speak to do. Mm. Oh, and definitely. the other 85% have pretty much got a flip chart with yeah. sheets of A4 yeah. that they tell their clients about. They're in a prescriptive place, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And actually, I think, you know, when you talk about the challenge of customers specifically in the sales process, I couldn't help but feel, as a book, it doesn't necessarily suit people who lean on a product particularly well. Go on, what do you mean? I mean that if you take the, the if you take the, the, the uh, my, my criticism of it actually is that I, I think it talks about moving from A to B and talking about, I can't remember how it words it now, but it has two circles, one of which is our USPs in the middle, one of which is the client's needs as a ring out the outside. It's about chapter... There you go. Yeah, that one, yeah, that one, that one. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't help but feel that that was, was the same as Miller Hyman talking about wins and results. Oh, I wrote that down earlier. And I thought to myself, yeah, sort of seen that before, really. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about, Glenn. You're talking about not turning up to a client and saying, listen, ah, oh, software's got five modules. Because the client doesn't care. The client cares about what the client cares about, what their needs are. Well, when I'm reviewing my team, the most common thing I say is, so what? Yeah. Like, Give me a pitch. And then I go, so what? What does that mean to me? So what? That seems like I'm furious. I was 23 when my first sales manager said that to me. What's the so what? So what? Christine Tide. She also used to make me put a mirror in front of my face and tell me to smile while I dialed. <laughs> But I used to say, I've got a good deal, and she'd say, so what? And she'd say, when's it coming in? I'd say, tomorrow. And she'd go, why? And then I'd say, because the client's really keen. And he'd, she'd say, so what? And she'd just say it until I could give her an answer as to why it was going to be a deal. Yeah, which but, is great training. Yeah, it's brilliant training. But you see, I think, Jonathan, you see, I think, that's, I think that's the reason you should like the book. Because I think the book takes a lot of very old-fashioned things and puts them in a very modern context. I'm a big fan of Miller Hyman. I love Miller Hyman, economic buyers, used Did buyers. it make you second guess Miller Hyman? It made me question the different buyers in Miller Hyman's framework of economic buyer, user buyer. You know, economic buyer can say no, can say yes when everybody else can say no. This book says that doesn't exist. Yeah, they're saying there's no such thing as an economic buyer who can say, who, thought, who can say yes when everyone else thought, can say no. I don't, because you'll get this. You know, we, we, you, we have it, certainly with an interviewing, you know, you have first, second interviews, third interviews, whatever, there's always somebody that can say yes and everybody else says no and that person goes, yeah, whatever. I'm going to hide it. What's that like for you in your environment, Glenn? Uh, I think basically it does depend on the, the, the economic market conditions as well at the time. You know, going back to the book and the way it works, it's, it, it's all very well having a, a process and a style that you follow. Um, but when you're in a recession, for example, the buying process is completely different. Yeah. When people are scared of Brexit and the impact it's going to have, you know, on manufacturing, for example, then mm -hmm. the buying process again changes dramatically. The, the, the fears and the opportunity shift the whole time. How have they shifted then? What, what's happening? What, what are people saying obviously in a manufacturing environment? What are customers talking about now? So, to be honest, in manufacturing, because of the, you know, to get topical, because of the, the, the slide in the pound, 
bad news in, in one respect for people that buy and product from abroad, but of course in manufacturing, a lot of people are exporting as well. So they're all laughing. So they're, they're laughing because of the exchange rate? Well, well laughing is probably uh, <laughs> too broad a term. They're still a really, gentle chuckle. They're, yeah, they're still really concerned. Mm. But um, for example, I met with um, a manufacturer a couple of weeks ago. This was a metal fabrication plant. Mm. And they'd just spent you know, a real shed load of money that they'd saved up for years on some German equipment. So obviously that was more expensive for them. But yes. conversely, they were shipping out almost double the amount of product that they were oh, this wow. time last year because people are cashing in quick because they, yeah because it's cheaper so to buy. So does that make them looser with their purse strings? How, how does that affect them in terms of the their style of buying? Do, well, con conversely, for for solution sellers, it's actually difficult because they're actually saying. If, if they're exporters, we're so busy at the moment, we need to concentrate on business more than our expansion plans and our automation. Right. With software and technology. Yes. Um, so. But, but the, at the back end of that, you know, more investment hopefully and, 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 and therefore more solution software. So there's almost, a, 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 they almost cease to perceive the pain because they're making hay. Yeah. Right, right, right now. But with with others that are not exporting so much, there is obviously some concern about the way this is all going to shake out. I think there's a big sigh of relief at the moment because of the you know the time it might take for for us to sort of press the button, as it were, and start the the official move out. So yeah, they, they, you know they feel like there's some breathing space, but yeah, still some concern. All right, here's one then, chaps. The book talks about challengers and mobilizers. It talks about two different types of salespeople. What they call Core, uh, core performers and star performers. Yeah, if I bought my, if I got a copy of Eads's Solution Selling, he talks about eagles and journeymen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what they're basically saying is, challengers sell to challengers within companies, and relationship builders sell to relationship builders within companies. Yeah. Now you and I both know, and don't deny it, Mike. Uh, how often do you sit in front of a candidate and you say, what makes you so good? And they'll say, well, I'm a great relationship builder. And I know it slightly frustrates you because they can't give you any better answer as to why they're a good salesperson. Yes, but it only frustrates me because the, the context of the question is unfair yeah. on the salesperson. Okay. What do we think of this comment? Challengers sell to challengers and relationship builders sell to relationship builders. And what they mean meaning by relationship builders is they're talking about the people that they split the stakeholder profiles down the middle, don't they? Yeah, they yeah. say there's three stakeholder profiles that are mobilizers and can get stuff done, and then there are three stakeholder profiles that are what they call talkers. Well, I think so, Glenn hit the nail on the head 20 minutes ago with people buy from people. Okay. Go on, expand. Because I think, I think if you're a challenger in your nature, um, yeah, sure, if you're a challenger in your nature, um, Somebody that's not a challenger isn't going to feel congruent in dealing with you. Ah, uh, good point. So I'm a challenger and I'm nat so are you, so are you saying I'm naturally drawn to challenge so if I go into a client account, I get on naturally well with challengers. No, why do we get with IT salespeople? Because we're salespeople. Yeah. You know, from, that's well, for me, yeah. I thought that, that part of it was the most rubbish. What's <laughs> that? that? If only we could choose the type of person that's going to be sat at the other side of the table. Well, that's very true. Then I could select my best salesperson to challenge a challenger. Correct. To relationship a relationship man. The truth is... The world doesn't work that way. The world way. doesn't work that way. And you, you don't, don't know and until you get there. And no. I can't then say, you know what, Jonathan, you're doing a great job on this sale, but I actually want Mike to go in there because he's a bit better at relationship than you are. It just <laughs> doesn't happen. Yeah, that's you very and you'd lose all of your credibility with your client. Yeah, fair So point, I, I think right. you just have to manage when you meet them and then enhance the team appropriately for yeah. the time. So if you're missing some sort of technical sale, you support them with a technical salesperson. If you need some business analysts input, then you bring the business analyst input in. But All you right. can't choose. And what happened to, um, and I, think, I think you're right here, Glenn. And what happened to training a relationship builder to be able to go and sell to a challenger? Good point. And what happened to training a challenger to go and sell to a relationship builder? You know, where's the commitment? The, the, if the book is to be believed, where's the commitment of the employer to develop the skills of the sales professional? That's not the book's job. What the book's telling us is that that... I, I found that the, the style of the book was like, this is gospel, this is word, and all else is not. Well, what else is it supposed to do? Oh, I'll tell you what, we've got an idea. It might be rubbish. <laughs> see, see, I think right. you're criticising the, the wrong bit of Yeah, I've fallen out, I've fallen out with the authors. 
Well, I've not, you know, I think Seth Godin... Seth Godin they were invited and they didn't want to come today by <laughs> Skype call, so they're getting pasted. Yeah, well, listen, I, I think, you know, we could sit here and talk about it Give all day. It, yeah, Let, let's, but, we'll do a quick wrap-up, I think. A couple of other bits. Um, for me, overall, I thought there were some really interesting bits at the back end where they talk about the insight based selling the importance of hiring correct... I know you that touched you quite a little bit. I, I tell you why it touched me, though. It touched me because I think... I think very often, and I am definitely this, people are either a salesperson or a marketeer. And that was actually chapters nine, 10, I think eight I wrote. The convergence of marketing and sales environment. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting insight to a salesperson about a marketeer. Marketeer's point of view and a marketeer's value add. Okay. You know, I think some of the companies I've worked for in the past haven't been the best marketed. And I thought to myself, that was great. And I think it's useful as a salesperson to learn a little bit about the marketing side of the book. But let's be fair, Jonathan, we're not here, you know, to sort of criticise the book and tear it apart. You might be. Um, yeah, I got down on you it. you know, we're here to learn stuff from it. And I thought, and I've, learned, I've actually learned a lot. I don't know about you, Glenn, about marketing and sales. I know you've got a bit of marketing hat. I don't know much about marketing. Well, listen, I, I, I'd be stunned. If any organisation could be successful in selling to anybody if they didn't completely encompass marketing. I'm not talking about reporting lines here. I'm saying everything you do should involve the marketing team. Yeah. So if you have objectives for the coming year, this is the market we want to enter. Uh, enter. This is the product we want to deliver. You know, this is the sales number we want to hear. You have to involve the and, marketing and in fairness, team. The, the, the book away. tied that together well, I thought. Yeah, and, 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 tied it beautifully in terms and, of. And, and I can tell you where where I and my teams have been most successful is where the marketing teams have felt part of the sales team throughout the whole year and the campaign. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, we could go for hours on this. Yeah. It's clearly. actually during the course of the discussion, it's gained a half a star out of me by sheer nature. In fact, it has made me think a lot more than I thought. Mike stars out of five. I've got to say, I can't, I, 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 and it's rare I say this, but I, I just sort of can't fault it really. Because I think that, you know, it, it's very difficult to disagree with it. It loses half a point for me. Because there's a touch of, as you pointed out, Glenn, it, it's an ideology that actually is bumming hard, you know, is actually hard to realise. I think there's a lot of stuff later on where it's talking about the three different kinds of mobilizers and then three different kinds of mobilizers in three different kinds of moods i think well there's nine different people who's got no, who's got time to figure out which nine they are then how to influence yeah what it. happened to working out right you're you're the guy i want to sell to and i'm going to go and understand and, you and i did think to myself and sell to you, you know it yeah. talks about dysfunctional buying teams i thought crikey if it buying team was that dysfunctional i might walk away but nonetheless i think a lot of it is a reinvention and a drawing together of lots of other stuffs I've never read a book that's combined Eads and Millerheim particularly well, and has included tactical selling side to it. If you've got to understand, you know, I think when it's picking out, talking about selling and influencing mobilizers, that's a tactical sales pitch. But they don't talk much about that. They talk loads about it. Yeah, but what they're not really talking about is how to win over a mobilizer. They are, that, that's where the marketing bit comes yeah, in. They're saying, they're yeah, saying, so, they're saying you've, got to create insight. you've got to create insight. My, my objection is, that the case study, the best case study they give about insight is this case study at Xerox, where they had a four-man team creating insight. Yeah, I mean that. And I calculated off the back of a fag packet <laughs> that you've got four people creating insight. I reckon typical average salary for each of the people in that team is about forty-five grand, yeah. plus expenses, plus snacks and coffee. Yeah. So we're into a quarter of a million pounds to create a piece of insight that we can use with which to attack this mobilizers. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses Can't haven't got the resource exactly to do that. Right. Right, well listen, you can't disagree that if it, if, if it was non-budget constraint, you could do that. And that's it, it fits the enterprise. So I'm going to give you an answer. I'm going to give it four and a half out of five. I, I wow. Thought it was, I thought it was good. Okay, yeah. mate. I right. thought it was great. For me, two out of five. <laughs> I can't believe the trusted advisor got more. Uh, when I didn't really like that one either. Two out of five, my reasoning as follows. One, lot of unrealistic expectations on the organisation and the book's predominantly written for companies attacking the enterprise market who are enterprise level that. companies. Yeah. My other point was, I think it's, the only thing that I did love about it is I got 95% of the way through the book and I realised 
it's a brilliant piece of of challenger insight in and of itself. Oh yeah, they're selling the CD. Design, they're, they're, they're selling the CD, they're selling the book. Yeah. And do you know what? If I worked at Xerox and I had a sales team that weren't that switched on and were living a little bit in the dark ages, didn't have much of a social savvy, I'd be buying that training now. So they get another half star for that. That took them up to about two stars. I thought it was the greatest piece of customer insight ever, but I didn't like the fact that it was solely and wholly aimed in the enterprise world. I've got a bias because I live in an SME world and I deal in the IT industry, and a lot of my clients are smaller companies attacking enterprise companies. And so for me, it didn't work. Two stars. Glad it looks like you've got the deciding vote here. Could well, go one of either way, this uh, couldn't it? Let me first say this. <laughs> with, with any sales book, and I've read a few. I'm not an academic by any means. Me neither. But, you know, more of a, you know, I've worked my way through life in sales, working with people and through people. Um, but I'd say that you know, you've never read too many sales books. There's no. always something, there's always a nugget in any book yes. that you can take away and say, you know, actually, that, I've never tried that, or actually I could apply that to the situation I'm working in. Mm. So I think as, as personalities and of selling styles, we're all different. So something that will work for you in the book would never work for me and yeah. I'd rubbish it. So I think you always have to say yeah, that yeah. about any sales book you read. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'd say is brilliant marketing ploy by them to pick up on the Challenger, Challenger name. So that everyone that's bought the Challenger sale sees it in the bookshop yeah. and thinks, oh, actually, I, I, can find out, I can find out what the customer <laughs> feels now about the way that the Challenger sale comes across. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, It's almost like 50 shades of grey. Let's get a follow-up out. Quick, everyone's <laughs> bought that. We'll buy the Challenger customer, yeah. although nowhere near as exciting. I'm I sorry. think it was more the difficult second album as they yeah. called it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the rock so, so, yeah, there's some, there's some real good stuff in it. Yeah. as we've discussed. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I think is just about people and the way people relax, but I, mean, I think there's a lot of ideology there. And I also think it's, as you said, Jonathan, heavily weighted towards bigger companies where you've got teams of people that can support you in that style of process of selling. So I'm gonna give it a three. Right, therefore, is it a hit or a miss based on my two stars, your four and a half? It's a hit. It's a hit, yeah, yeah. It's a hit, right? For read. Great, so, uh, uh, ideas for next books. What do you fancy? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd take a bit of because um, the problem is I want to read a sales book that I've not read. Yeah, there is that. So I'm sort of really biased towards some of them. Um, I, I actually have no idea at all. I think it might be interesting to read a good tactical selling book to rival spin something like that. Cause something a bit more about the one-on-one -on -one moment. On -one. The one-on-one -on -one moment. Because that's your point, Glenn. You're talking about selling to people. Yeah, Dale yeah. Carnegie. Yeah. How to win friends and influence people. I think One of the best that, books I've ever read. I think it's deeply, a, I think deeply. I've important. always wanted to read that. It's a great book. I, I think. It's stood the test of time, that. So, so, yeah, that it has. How yeah. often do we meet candidates? There's the think? basics of, of people yeah. there and mm, yeah, fair interaction. Much. And I would say often the highest performing sales guys we meet are all good at one thing and one thing alone, which is they're good at walking into a meeting and selling to the bloke in front of them. Yeah, 100% agree with all that. All right, well, we'll pick a more tactical one. Um, if you want to email us or drop us a note on LinkedIn with any ideas, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, and at that, goodbye. Bye, Thank guys. You. Thanks.